testing, testing, testing.
Good evening. Welcome back to Resurrection Orthodox Presbyterian Church's guided household worship sermon live stream for the evening of May 10th. Here we are about to have a one sermon sermon series on a whole book of the Bible tonight on Obadiah, the shortest book in the Old Testament. Looking forward to this. This is going to conclude our four book uh, sort of mini series through the beginning of the uh, minor prophets. We've done Hosea, Joel, Amos, now Obadiah. Um, after Obadiah, we're going to transition and uh, spend time in Psalms uh, during the evenings <clears throat> uh, through the late spring and early summer. Um, so this will be our last sermon in the minor prophets for a while until we return to them at a later time. Before we begin Obadiah tonight, we're going to read a New Testament passage from Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're reading this passage because it contains a, a, at least a couple of themes that are, are relevant for some things we're going to be talking about in Obadiah tonight. In particular, it talks about, um, it warns against arrogance and encourages towards humility, which is a major theme in Obadiah. Also, um, it talks about how the Lord is a, an avenging God, a God who takes very seriously and personally um, attacks on his people so that, of course, we, we often think of Romans 12 as teaching us not to take vengeance for ourselves. The reason given for that is that God does avenge his people, which is a great comfort for believers and also a, a reason for us then. Um, not to take vengeance for ourselves. Before we read, let's pray and ask for God's help. Our Father in heaven, thank you once again for uh, gathering us for this sermon. We thank you for inspiring your servant Obadiah to write the prophecy that we're going to consider tonight. And Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit who inspired this prophecy would also open our hearts to understand it to believe it, to receive it, and act upon it, particularly as he tonight shows us the Lord Jesus Christ revealed uh, through Obadiah's prophecy. And as we see the gospel um, laid out for us, we ask that that would be clear to all of those who hear. We ask that all of those within the reach of this message over the internet um, would be granted hearts of faith uh, and uh, to be able to see Christ clearly and to embrace him as he's offered in the gospel. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 19. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Amen. Now let's turn to the prophecy of Obadiah. If you have trouble finding that, it's the fourth of the minor prophets, very near the end of the Old Testament. So Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and right before the uh, wonderful book of Jonah. Tonight, Obadiah. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. 
Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap beneath you. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Amen. The, the time period that we most often associate with the book of Psalms is the time of King David, who wrote many of the Psalms. But not all of the Psalms were written by David, and not all of them come from the time of King David. Psalm 90, for instance, goes all the way back to Moses, very, very early in Israel's history. Um, other Psalms come from hundreds of years after David, and one of them is Psalm 137, which is set all the way during the Babylonian exile. Okay, so why am I bringing up Psalm 137 when there's supposed to be a sermon on Obadiah? Well, here's the reason. Psalm 137 helps us to understand uh, the historical context for the book of Obadiah. It's the psalm that begins, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. It's this very emotional scene where the exiles from Jerusalem are just devastated that they've been carried into captivity and their, their captors are trying to force them 
to sing uh, songs from their homeland. Sing us one of the songs of Zion, the captors say, like uh, in the return of the king. If you remember that scene where uh, Denethor, the steward of Gondor, makes Pippin sing one of the songs from the Shire while Faramir is riding off to certain death. And uh, there's all of this deep emotion in that psalm of remembering Jerusalem, remembering their homeland as all of this emotion washes over these exiles. As that happens, what comes to their minds is not only anger and grief about Babylon. Verse 7 is very specific about their anger and grief with regards to another nation, another people group. As they say, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem, how they said, how the Edomites said to the Babylonians, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. And so that picture of the Edomites cheering on the Babylonians as they sacked Jerusalem is this very vivid image of cruelty and kind of opportunism uh, that corresponds very closely with what we just read about Edom in the prophecy of Obadiah, where it's the nation of Edom that's primarily in the crosshairs for the same reason as in Psalm 137. So as we explore this uh, very short book tonight, we're going to divide it into three parts under the headings, come down, verses one through nine, Comeuppance, verses 10 to 16, and come back, verses 17 to 21. Come down because God rebukes Edom's arrogance in particular. Comeuppance because Edom's punishment is going to fit their crimes. And come back because Obadiah looks forward in this prophecy to the restoration of Israel and the reestablishment of the kingdom of God after Edom has been destroyed. Okay, so let's first look at the dramatic come down that God has planned for the nation of Edom. Remember, first of all, that the Edomites were this neighboring nation south and southeast of Judah, just adjacent to the, to the promised land. And uh, the, the people of Edom were descended from Esau, the twin brother of Jacob. You remember that story from back in Genesis. And that's why. Um, Obadiah verse 10 refers to your brother Jacob. If you remember that history of Jacob and Esau, you'll recall that um, Jacob and Esau, Israel and Edom were always rivals, even back in utero. Gen Genesis 25, 22, uh, the children struggled together within Rebekah, Isaac's wife. And so she went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. And two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. And the two sons were Esau, the firstborn, and Jacob, the secondborn. And the two nations then were Israel, the descendants of Jacob, and Edom, the descendants of Esau. Jacob and Esau, of course, went through a lot of interpersonal conflict with each other during their own lives which was a preview then of the national conflict that would persist for generations between their descendants, between Israel and Edom. So much so that Isaac actually told his son Esau after Jacob stole his blessing uh, in Genesis 27, by your sword you shall live, Esau, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Well, down through the centuries, there are a lot of examples in the Old Testament of conflict uh, between Israel and Edom. But the specific incident that Obadiah has in mind is almost certainly the same one that the author of Psalm 137 was so angered by. Um, it seems that when Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon sacked Jerusalem in 586 B.C., was the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. 
or at least the, the, it was the a key moment near the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, uh, the nation of Edom took the side of the Babylonians, cheering them on, as we saw in Psalm 137, gloating, rejoicing, boasting over Israel's downfall, Obadiah 12, looting Jerusalem, verse 13, and even colluding with the Babylonians by cutting off those trying to escape from Jerusalem and handing them over to, uh, to their enemies, verse 14. And now we should remember before we go any further that Judah and Jerusalem richly deserved everything that they got from the Babylonians. Um, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 586 BC and the, the exile to Babylon was a very long time coming. God had been patiently warning Judah about this for decades. And Judah had, of course, repeatedly rejected God's prophets, ignored the warnings that God had sent over and over and over until finally the promised judgment fell in full with that Babylonian invasion. But throughout the prophets, along with God's threats to use foreign armies like Babylon to judge his people Israel, we also find God promising to one day judge those foreign empires also. God wielded them as tools, as weapons in his hand to execute judgment on his covenant people. But that did not mean that God was pleased with those pagan foreign nations. In the prophets, God frequently turns back and forth from his warnings against Israel and Judah to pronounce judgment against Babylon, against Assyria, against other nations who formed part of God's plan to discipline Israel and Judah. So just because Judah deserved to be punished for their sin, deserved destruction, captivity, and exile, did not mean that the nations who attacked them were acting righteously. And if that's true of a distant foreign empire like Babylon, how much more is that true of a small neighboring nation with an ancient family relationship with Israel? A relationship that ought to have given rise to a kind of solidarity in the face of this great invasion from the north, but instead resulted in this very petty, very opportunistic gloating over Israel's or Judah's downfall. So Obadiah's kind of opening salvo, the beginning of his prophecy, doesn't actually focus directly on that main incident, on the destruction of Jerusalem, yet. Um, instead, Obadiah starts by focusing on an underlying character flaw of the Edomite nation that uh, in perhaps in part gave rise to their behavior towards Judah at that time. And that underlying character flaw was Edom's arrogant self-confidence, their arrogant self-confidence. The pride of your heart has deceived you, verse 3. You who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? And Obadiah says, though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is among the stars, I will from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Edom was a mountainous region. You often hear of it referred to in connection with Mount Seir. And uh, the Edomites were no doubt very proud of their mountain fortresses, uh, their fortifications where they would have felt uh, very secure against enemy assaults. Of course, it's always easier to talk big and act tough when you feel untouchable. Edom had uh, acted towards Israel as the geopolitical equivalent of a small-time bully, a kind of hanger-on, riding on the coattails of a bigger kingpin bully, Babylon, and feeling kind of invincible, untouchable as a result. But that sense of security, that sense of invincibility, turns out to be just 
paper thin, doesn't it? As you look across the scriptures, not just here, suddenly you consistently see over and over and over throughout the Bible um, about the character of God is that he absolutely hates this kind of arrogant, conceited self-confidence wherever he finds it. And here it's no different. Uh, God is going to completely burst Edom's bubble of security, turn the tables, and, and bring them down, not just a notch or two. He's going to bring them all the way down to the bottom. Behold, I will make you small among the nations, verse 2. You shall be utterly despised. The very thing Edom perhaps most dreaded as this sort of bully nation. You may notice that the imagery in verse 4 um, is much like what we saw last week in Amos chapter 9, um, that there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the judgment of God. It doesn't matter if you go make your nest in the stars, because God is all-present. He's all-seeing. He's all-powerful. And he is going to bring Edom down no matter how secure they feel, no matter how inaccessible their fortresses seem to be, how unassailable their strongholds are. Nowhere is safe from the Lord, who is everywhere and who has all power. Isn't it interesting, um, in light of this morning's sermon text from James chapter 1, what God says in verse 3 about Edom's pride. He says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Isn't that an interesting statement? See, it's, it's not that Edom really was invincible and God is somehow finding a miraculous way uh, just barely to overcome that. It's not that, um, it's not that they really were as powerful as they thought they were. It's that they never really were all that powerful in the first place, not from God's point of view. They were self-deceived by their own pride. They wanted to think of themselves as strong and impregnable, and so they began to imagine themselves that way. But it was all an illusion. And that's the way sin always works, sin of all kinds, and especially pride. What happens is our desires deceive us. They lure and entice us with things that aren't true. That's what we saw this morning in James chapter 1. And so we convince ourselves then, when it comes to pride, the sin of pride in particular, we convince ourselves to think of ourselves much more highly than we ought to think. That's how Paul puts it, instead of thinking with sober judgment. You see Paul use that language in Romans chapter 12. So don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment about yourselves. And that, when, when we get that backwards, it puts us in a, a very perilous position because... God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Okay, so what is this come down for Edom going to look like? Well, for one thing, it's going to be total. God isn't going to pull any punches. Uh, I see in verses 5 uh, through 7, or 5 and 6, rather, um, that uh, a merely human adversary, like a thief, like a burglar, would, you know, they'd break in, they'd take a few valuables, they'd hightail it out of there, and there would be something left. But when God brings judgment on Edom, they're going to be thoroughly plundered. There are going to be no leftovers as when uh, a little bit of the crop is left in the field or, or on the vine after a harvest. Esau is going to be pillaged. His treasures are going to be sought out. God is going to make a thorough job of this judgment. But what I want to particularly focus your attention on is in verses 7 through 9, how God here very systematically reviews all of Edom's sources of security and power, all of the things that they would have relied on for strength, for confidence, and he undermines every single one, one by one by one. Um, every single one God is going to turn upside down, make it completely worthless, worthless, reveal it for what it really is. Um, first of all, all of those alliances with the other nations that you're counting on will, 
Those other nations now are going to deceive and betray you. Those alliances aren't going to be worth anything. The people who used to eat at your table, those, those personnel allies that you had this understanding with, well, they're going to start to entrap you. Um, your own wise men, that's wise in the way that the world counts wisdom, the, 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 the men in Edom who knew how to run a country, the people who knew how to lead and influence people, how to get things done and engineer success for the nation. God says, I'm going to destroy them. There are going to be no more wise and understanding people in Edom. And your mighty men, your warriors that you count on to be courageous, to be valiant, to be stalwart defenders of your people militarily, well, they're going to be dismayed. They're going to be cut off by slaughter. And so everything that Edom depends on, all of these seemingly uh, this, this, this seemingly uh, ideal combination of national strength and international alliances, all of it is going to vanish beneath their feet at the stroke of God's judgment. Everything that they thought was a safe bet, a sure thing, you, a can't-lose proposition, all of it is going to be gone. And why? The reason is because God hates arrogance. God cannot stand the conceit of self-confidence. And wherever he finds it, sooner or later, he will expose it for how flimsy it really is. I want you to think about yourself at this point. Ask yourself the question, what do you count on to make you feel safe? What makes you feel confident, like everything is going to be okay? For some of you, it may be your job. It may be your investments, your nest egg. Or maybe you don't have uh, that, but you do have skills. You have knowledge. You have a good work ethic. Or maybe it's your, your social network, your rep web of relationships. You're a people person. And those relationships give you strength and security. Maybe it's a political affiliation. Uh, thinking more broadly, you know, as, as a nation here in the U.S., we certainly seem to put as much stock in our military strength as any uh, and, and strong national defense as any nation ever has. And all of those, of course, can be good things. They can be good gifts of God. Jobs, relationships, investments, you know, even uh, a, a good military to, pr to protect us. Um, they can be good gifts of God. But the thing is, all of them are much more fragile than we often realize. Much more fragile than they seem. And we've got to keep a very realistic God's eye perspective on them. You just think about the last couple of months, a lot of very secure jobs have been lost in the last couple of months. A lot of very good investments have fallen apart, disintegrate. Think how quickly relationships that you've counted on have fallen apart. People let you down. Think about just how this tiny little virus uh, has, has, has turned upside down so many things that we thought were untouchable. In American life, and how foolish we would be to come away from this experience in particular, counting really on anything in this life to keep us truly safe, to guarantee that everything is going to be okay. When what we really need is to learn this lesson from Edom, learn this lesson that Edom was going to have to learn the hard way, this lesson that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. Some in mountain fortresses like Edom, some in political alliances like Edom, some in the stock market, some in the military, some in technology, some in physicians. But we don't. We trust in none of those things. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. That's what it means to be a Christian, to put your trust in Him and to see everything else in all of its fragility, flimsiness before him, so that you rest 
your confidence, your assurance that everything is going to be okay on the Lord and on the Lord alone. The next things that uh, the next thing Obadiah shows us is not only that Edom is going to experience a come down, but that that come down is going to correspond in some specific ways to the particular crimes they've committed against Israel. And in that sense, it's going to be also number two, a comeuppance. And I use that word. I'm not I'm not sure how much of a regional southern thing that word is. Um, if you don't know, it means getting what you deserve. You're just desserts, often in a way that's very fitting or very ironic because of what you did to deserve it. And it's it's not just Edom's uh, conceitedness in general that God's going to punish, but specifically uh, the terrible things that they did to God's people during the sack of Jerusalem. Um, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever, God says. And then Obadiah lists some of those specific crimes, which we've already touched on, standing aloof when Babylon invaded, uh, kind of blending in with Israel's enemies as one of them, gloating over Israel's downfall, looting, turning over Israelites who were trying to run away. And the Lord says in verse 15, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. So what you've done to Israel, other nations are going to do to you now. So when Israel was ransacked, God says, you, you drank, you drank wine in celebration. And God says, you know what? I'm going to make you drink something else. You're going to drink all right. It's not going to be the wine of celebration. You're going to drink the cup of my wrath. You and all the nations who oppose my people shall drink continually. Verse 16, they shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been this consuming cup of judgment. And uh, then we could ask, when is all this going to happen? What's well, going to happen? And we've seen this throughout our study of the Minor Prophets, right? On the day of the Lord, repeated theme, the day of the Lord, verse 15, the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, God says. And that is the day when God is going to settle all the scores. One thing that we don't want to miss from this part of Obadiah is that God takes it very personally when his people are attacked, when his people are mistreated. And you should be encouraged by this aspect of Obadiah. You should be encouraged to know that God notices every attack, every slight, every insult that the world levels against you or levels against us as the people of God. He does not ignore them. He does not forget them. And the thing is, you can count on him to see. You can count on him to account for these things and to make them all right in the end, not to let any of them go by, not dealt with. And that's why in the New Testament, you're encouraged then never to avenge yourself. Not because injustices and insults and harm that you endure from others doesn't matter, that God's just saying, it's not that big of a deal, don't worry about it. No, it is a big deal, but God is saying, I've taken that responsibility on myself. You can be free not to avenge yourselves, but to leave it to the wrath of God. Romans 12, verse 19. Why? Because it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And that's what God is promising Israel or Judah he's going to do here. In fact, we should remember, um, as a couple of commentators point out, that the primary audience of this prophecy is not Edom. It's addressed to Edom in this sort of rhetorical way. But who's supposed to really be hearing this message from the prophet Obadiah? Well, it's the people of God who are supposed to be hearing it, particularly the people in Judah who are still listening to God's word, who care what God has to say about their situation, uh, which no doubt would have been a, a minority at this point in Judah's history. Judah, which had become a very wicked nation. But well, who were the people we're talking about here are the people we might call the faithful remnant that the prophets so often speak of. They can hear this prophecy of God's servant, and they can know, you know, God hasn't left Edom's abuses unnoticed. God knows, God sees. And he's going to make it right in the end. And not only that, God is not just going to bring Edom down. He is one day going to bring about a great restoration 
of his own people. And that's the third point tonight. So we've seen come down, come up, and now come back. A comeback of the people of God, starting in verse 17. The nations are going to drink down God's judgment, but in Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape. Again, that faithful remnant. And it, Mount Zion, shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. So when the day of the Lord comes, Israel is going to be like this fire, and Edom is going to be like stubble that God's people are going to burn up and consume. So completely are the tables going to be turned as Israel is now on top. As uh, God's faithful remnant gains the ascendancy, as they're empowered by their almighty covenant God. And then Edom, on the other, other hand, experiences the oblivion of God's overwhelming opposition. So now Mount Esau is going to be possessed by the Negev. The Negev is the southern part of, of Judah. It's part of Judah's territory. So Judah is going to possess now Mount Esau. And this great renaissance of Judah's power then is going to extend over other nations besides Edom too. The Philistines, the Canaanites, the, um, the, the territory of the old, old northern kingdom. He speaks of Ephraim and Samaria and Gilead. All those are parts of the northern territory. All of this is now going to be controlled by God's restored remnant as saviors go up to Mount Zion, verse 21, to rule Mount Esau, uh, God's people now being in charge of the nations instead of the other way around. And the ultimate spiritual reality underlying this is what's revealed in that very last line, verse 21, which is very important for understanding the entire book, really, which is that the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. That is the ultimate goal that Obadiah is pushing us towards in this whole prophecy. In some ways, you could say it's really the, the main point, the kingship of God. God is king. And so Edom, that means that you're not as secure as you think you are. Not against him. God is king. And so he's going to administer justice on behalf of his people and against those who have unfairly taken advantage of them and allied themselves with their enemies. God is king. And so he's going to act to reestablish his kingdom visibly, extending his power over all the world by reestablishing his covenant people in security and peace with this dominion over the nations. I think it's fascinating, uh, as one writer points out, that when Jesus was born, centuries after this, who was Jesus' first great enemy when he was still just a baby, it was Herod the Great. Now, why do I bring up Herod the Great? That very cruel, ruthless tyrant who acted with treachery and deception to try to uh, trick the Magi into revealing Jesus' location. And when that fails, he lashes out in cruelty and violence in an attempt to destroy Jesus, the true son of Abraham. And do you know what Herod's ethnicity was? He wasn't a Jew. He was an Idumean. An Idumean, and the Idumeans were the lingering descendants of, you guessed it, the Edomites. The Edomites, who were, were eventually driven out of their land, displaced, their geopolitical power was decimated, as Obadiah prophesied. Under Roman imperial power, Herod rose to prominence as a king operating under Roman imperial rule, and he, he did his level best to destroy God's anointed savior, the one who had been born king of the Jews, and the nations had come to worship the Magi. But he failed, didn't he? And why did he fail? He failed because the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Like, like Obadiah prophesied, because all of the conceited arrogance and selfish pride of Herod were powerless. They were paper thin against the sovereign majesty of God, who was in the business of setting his king, his savior, on his holy hill of Zion. And as we saw last time at the end of Amos, it is now through the proclamation worldwide of the gospel in response to the Great Commission, that God is now extending the kingly power of the risen Christ 
over all the nations in fulfillment of this conclusion of Obadiah's prophecy, not through conquest, but through his word and spirit through the proclamation of the gospel. And that then is what you and I are a part of. We are living through right now as the people of God, as the servants of Christ, as the, as the Savior who has gone up to Mount Zion. That's what you and I are a part of if we have humbled ourselves under his rule to begin with. This is true of you if you are taking refuge not in your works, not in your wisdom, not in your power, not in your competence like Edom, but in his power and competence and work for you, in his sacrifice on the cross on your behalf, not trusting in your wealth or your power or your intelligence or your connections and alliances with others, but in his mighty power and kingship that he exercises on your behalf, and that's what you are counting on. It's in Christ that you come to participate then in that beautiful scene that we saw earlier in our uh, household worship plans in Revelation 11, where the loud voices in heaven proclaim that the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and everyone around the throne prays, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged like Edom, but your wrath came and the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. That's what God is promising to do in the book of Obadiah, is to destroy the destroyers of the earth and to reward his servants as he establishes his kingdom on earth. That is ultimately what Obadiah's prophecy looks forward to. That is ultimately what you and I are looking forward to in the end, when the kingdom, which is the Lord's already, he has begun to reign. We are looking forward to the time when it will be fully revealed and we will join in that reign openly and fully, forever and ever. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this brief uh, prophecy of Obadiah and for the great um, comfort and warning and hope that it contains for the people of God. We ask, Lord, that you would fill our hearts with a zeal for your kingdom, that we would not look to any other source of confidence, any other source of, of strength and security for giving us that sense that everything is going to be okay, except ultimately to you. Lord, teach us to look to your kingdom, to your power, to your kingship over us, your kingship in us, and our kingship with you through Christ as our only source of confidence, our hope and comfort in life and in death. Lord, we are so thankful for this promise that the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And so in conclusion, we pray that to you would be the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night and God bless you. Look forward to uh, having <clears throat> another sermon available next week, maybe in a slightly different format. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for updates about that, uh, either through the church email list or through our social media. We'll let you know uh, during this week if there are going to be any modifications uh, involving in-person uh, service, limited in-person services of some kind, and the ways that that might uh, translate into to modified online resources. Uh, but we will plan to continue having morning and evening um, worship resources and sermons available to all of you who need to continue worshiping from home for as long as uh, we need to, for as long as it takes. Uh, so we look forward to continuing to, to provide those. We hope that they're useful and a blessing to you. For now, I hope that you all go in peace with uh, God's word ringing in your ears and in your hearts, and that you and your families enjoy a. Uh, a peaceful Sunday evening and uh, rest 
in Christ as you prepare for the week uh, of, of work and service that he's sending you out into together. Good night.